Welcome everyone to A New Year, A New Book, Strategies to Publish, Promote and Profit. I'm Victoria Bennett and I'm joined by my co-host Charmaine Hammond, um, a seasoned author and expert in turning books into business opportunities. And we're thrilled to guide you through today's discussion with our esteemed panelists, um, each a powerhouse in the world of publishing and marketing. I'm going to start off with Charmaine. Um, Charmaine is an 11 times best-selling author and the owner of Razor Dream Training and Consulting Inc. She's also the creator of your book as a business program and has been instrumental in securing over a million dollars in sponsorship for projects and clients. Thank you. And I'm going to introduce Victoria today for our webinar. Victoria brings a lot of experience as a force behind the crowdfunding hub, supporting numerous successful crowdfunding campaigns. And together, Victoria and I have been developing the Crowdfunding for Authors program, uh, drawing on, uh, Victoria has done, the, I always tell people, put your seatbelts on for this, but Victoria has uh, 20 million raised through crowdfunding for her different client projects. So that's amazing. And some of those projects have been to do with authors and content creators. So you're in good hands for all things related to crowdfunding. And Victoria, I'll pass it back to you to introduce our incredible guest today, because we've got some really powerhouse uh, oh, panelists absolutely. today. Absolutely, some great panelists. So first off, I'm going to introduce, I'm going to point, but you know, I never know what it's like on other people's screens. So I'm pointing it to, yeah, to you, Tina. So Tina is the CEO of the Twin Flame Studios, an award-winning speaker and audiobook publisher. Her expertise in vocal leadership and as a podcast producer has made her a prominent figure in thought leadership through audio media. Gail Watson is the founder and CEO of Women's Speakers Association and WSA Publishing, and she is a beacon of support for women finding their voice. Her work with WSA Publishing has uplifted numerous aspiring authors. Catherine Sakely Stevens, with 30 years as a digital content market strategist, Catherine is the president of the Networking Web. She specializes in LinkedIn and empowering business to transform their marketing efforts into revenue generating uh, strategies. Catherine is recovering from an eye injury and is wearing light blocker glasses. It's not just the sun in Calgary. So um, I'm going to start off, I'm going to um, ask questions to each each. Uh, member of the team. Um, we, we, I'm actually going to ask um, Charmaine first and then work our way through. And um, we will have time for questions at the end. So please, you know, get your pens ready, you know, write, write down any notes. Um, if we can, if they make sense, I'll sneak them in whilst we're talking. Otherwise, we will um, make sure that they're addressed by the end. But you are going to get some fabulous information. And if, if this is your year, to get your book published, then this is a brilliant way to start it off. So Charmaine, um, based on your vast experience, what key strategies should an author implement to turn their book into a business? Mm, what a juicy question to start with. Well, let, let me take you back to 2010 when my first book came out. That's when I started learning about the importance of systematizing everything you do. Because as an author, there are many tasks, for example, reaching out to podcast hosts or media or doing press releases or writing letters uh, to bookstores, calling um, book clubs to get featured on their club. There's many tasks that you do over and over again. And I learned early on that the more that you can systematize what you do, the more prepared you will be to turn your book into a business. But some of the other things to consider is that a lot of times authors, and I did this myself in the beginning, we look at our book as an individual product instead of how it fits in with our entire business. In my business, I do speaking, I do training for companies, I host events, I appear at other people's events. I mentor people. And so we started to look at where my book would fit into different parts of my business. For example, when I was speaking, maybe the books were included in my speaking fee, or I was selling books at the conference that I presented at. Um, the other piece, which is what really excites me about today's guests, is that when you think about your book as a business, there's also opportunity for you to explore things like having a wraparound workbook or a journal 
or an audio program or a podcast or turning your book into an audio book or creating a massive digital marketing campaign that will help you bring in more people into your community or creating programs and products around it. So I think when you look at your book as a business instead of a singular product, you have a much easier time selling books, selling books in bulk, getting sponsors for your books, and more. That's a fantastic uh, answer. And hopefully that answered um, at least some of those, those sort of ones uh, going out there. And I just wanted to say jumbo to Christine, just seeing somebody coming up there. And um, thank you for all the, uh, the other comments that are coming through. Don't forget to save those questions. Charmaine. Sorry, I was just, oh, there was a question there. The webinar is one hour. So just, there was a yes. question there. I just wanted to, to uh, make sure people knew that. One thing I wanted to add before we um, move forward is the other piece about turning your book into a business is really having a plan. We spend so much time, and I know, Gail, you talk to authors about this. So do you, Christine, and uh, or Catherine and Tina. You talk about sort of getting the book out. And then there's that also the other piece that you work on with them around marketing and having a plan. So as we go through today's content, and as you're listening to each of the speakers, make sure that you're considering what is your plan? What is your plan the whole way along? All right, let me get, so I'm doing the next question, am I? Yes, please. Okay, sorry, my paper just, uh, okay. So Victoria, this one's for you. And we really want to hear your insights on how authors can effectively and um, successfully use crowdfunding, but not just to fund elements of their book, like an audiobook or a tour. What else can they do? How do they use crowdfunding to actually build a community so that they have a community of readers and raising fans? Mm -hmm. Raving fans, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we've been we've been running our crowdfunding for authors course now for a couple of years. And so it's really given us a chance to see uh, benefits that we expected and also some benefits we didn't expect. Um, I mean, in many ways, the pre-selling of books is just the, one of the biggest things and being able to pre-sell bulk books. But there's also the opportunity for upselling. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing, um, you know, some people are, are running, um, uh, are offering uh, for book clubs. So they might have, you know, as one of their perks, their campaign, you know, 10 books or 20 books, and you hop on a Zoom call and you do a, a book club. So you're actually getting out there and you're connecting with your readers. And so throughout the whole campaign, as you're running your campaign, you're connecting with the people who actually want to read your book. And what we're also seeing there is, you get two covers, you know, you get your, your designer to come up with a designer. You're like, I don't know which one. Well, you've got people who want to read your book and you can actually go out to them because you have their emails and you go, which cover do you like? So you get to do market research. We found even thinking about who your, your target backer is. We had uh, one lady went through our, our uh, program and we asked them to think about how do you want the person to feel at the end of reading your book? How do you want them to, you know, you know what, what, how do you want to, and when she did that, she realized that her book wasn't what she wanted it to be. And she ended up rewriting the book and it's now super successful. And so there's all these other benefits that come from crowdfunding because you're getting to know your crowd, not just the money you're getting to test. Um, I know uh, we've seen people in their emails, they've put sections of their book in. Um, and again, you know, to see what people think of the tone, um, but it, there's so much that can come from the crowdfunding, but there's also the, the, the funding as well. The other one I'm just thinking, um, there's a, a, a one person going through the program at the moment and she has, we do have he's as well. I'm going to I'm just, sorry, I just saying she's because these are the ones that are coming top of my head, but she had, was like, do I do a journal to go with my book? Or do I do a diary to go? But, you know, it's slightly mm -hmm. sort of, you know, it's like, you know, one was sort of more of a sort of like workbooky type thing and one was more so calendar based. And by actually offering both, she saw which one got more backers, in which case, which one would be the more, the more popular one. And we often see this with crowdfunding as, it, it, you know, it really helps you 
refine what you want to offer. Um, but always think of those upsells. And um, if you're running it as a book, as a business, we're seeing people who are, say, charging 500 bucks, you know, to, to get the book, but also to have some time with you. So it's actually building up your business as well. So those would be the, the things. I don't know. I'm sure you've got many other things as well, Charmaine, which, which you've seen as well, or anybody else on the panel. I'll just add something that one of the um, one of the challenges I hear from lots of authors and aspiring authors, or those authors who have thirty books in their head and they're just trying to get one done, is that how do I afford all of the different elements of putting that book together? And so the publishing, the editing, all of the professional services, even for some authors, it it is even in the writing process. How do I afford a ghostwriter? How do I afford someone to help me even pull that book out of my head? And I think that's where crowdfunding can help authors in those stages. And then, like you said, that building a crowd, that's a big challenge. And I know our, our, our guests today who work with all kinds of different authors and aspiring authors, I'm sure you've all heard what a challenge it is for authors to find their community, to build their crowd so that when they go out on launch day, there's people there celebrating them and purchasing their book as well. Is that a fair statement, Tina, Catherine, Gail? Absolutely. 100%. For sure. Excellent. So Tina, um, in today's digital era, how important is it for authors to explore audiobooks and podcasts? And what are the first steps into venturing into these platforms? It, it is a brave new world, particularly since so many people don't like the sound of their own voice. And uh, so that's one of the things that, that comes up a lot when we talk about podcasting and, and audiobooks. Uh, and I don't know what my camera just did, so we're just going to roll with it. Uh, <laughs> go here. Uh, but when you're considering things like podcasting and audiobooks, the first thing you need to look at is, of course, what's the feasibility? Should I even be considering this? And so a couple of numbers to, to remember is, are that half of Americans listen to podcasts and um, more than half of that group of people listen to podcasts weekly. Mm -hmm. So no matter what's happening in the podcasting industry, and you'll hear things in the news about how podcasting is saturated or podcasting is dead or probably get, unless you're reading the articles and you understand the industry, most of that is clickbait. And what's happening is like any younger industry, podcasting is finding its niche and the in the beginning of a um, the development of a medium, and actually media medium, um, it's going to go through a number of transformations. So podcasting underwent a major transformation last year, both from a uh, financial underpinnings as well as an audience standpoint. I'll leave that there because that's not what we're really here to talk about today, but just know that hundreds of millions of people listen to podcasts. Um, on the audiobook side of thing, what a lot of folks don't know is that audiobooks have experienced double digit growth in the industry year over year over year, every year for the last 10 years. And for 10 years, it has been and continues to be the fastest growing segment of the publishing industry. All that being said, you know, billions of dollars just in the US alone being sold in audiobooks. But is it right for you is really another question. So when you are stepping into that and, and getting to understand if this is going to be a good factor for you, podcasts or audiobooks or both, um, I will say that uh, much like Charmaine has started to touch on and, um, and Victoria as well, you, these elements need to be part of a larger strategy. They can't just be slapped on. And that's one of the, the most difficult things about any of these elements of building your platform is how do they all interweave together? I'm sure Catherine has plenty to say about that. And uh, <laughs> um, so when you are considering an audiobook, you want to take a look at, um, and, and this is mostly speaking in the realm of nonfiction audiobooks. We can talk about fiction as well, but they do breathe differently as an industry, as a business model. Uh, as building your platform is different. So I'm going to stay mostly in the nonfiction realm here. And as this is part of your platform, your audiobook needs to act not only as a product, but it also is a promotional tool. And it also is a wealth of information, much like the other versions of your book 
that you can turn into other products to strengthen and develop the platform that you're building in the realm of um, courses, programs, uh, social media materials, articles. You, it ties into your search engine optimization. So having a clear strategy about how you're going to connect the dots between the work you want to be doing in the world and how these different pieces function in developing this platform is the place where you have to start strategically. Podcasts, same thing. Um, I often don't recommend right now that people start a biweekly or weekly podcast because it's a tremendous amount of work to do well. <laughs> Anybody can do it, but if you're going to do it well, having it even as a monthly podcast or a limited series podcast, which I believe is one of the most underutilized forms of podcasting is an important thing to consider because you can always continue on. You can always add more. What you don't want to do is overwhelm and overcommit your system because things change very quickly as you are building a platform and you want to be able to pivot at, with an agile um, mind and with an agile pocketbook at the same time. So these are the ways that you can step in with less risk as a book companion podcast or a, a um a short, shorter series of intentional limited series podcasts. So those are things we can um, certainly talk about more as, as we go on, but that's the general context when you're looking to get started with those two audio elements. You're muted, Victoria. I know, and I had the Q and A up over my mute, so unmute myself. So, <laughs> no, I think that's that's really interesting, and and I mean, time and time again, I'm hearing about you know how uh, everybody's listening to podcasts. Although the interesting thing I'm also hearing is that they're very difficult to search. So you know, it, it, I'm hearing sort of people are doing video pod, you know, uh, webinars or or um, vodcasts or whatever they're called today. Um, to get the searchability, but then using the podcast for the listenability. So, um, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, Charmaine and I know the, uh, the challenges of trying to create weekly podcasts. So um, I also really like that, the comment about, um, you know, putting it as part of a strategy and actually looking at how you can use that content. I think sometimes people are nervous about using content in multiple places because they're like, it's already been used. But not everyone sees it in multiple places. Not at all. Um, so, you know, I, I think you might be bored of sometimes the content, but it doesn't mean everybody else is. And it does mean you're consistent with your messaging. So, so that's great. Um, so we've got a comment here uh, from Colleen about uh, podcast searchability is helped by good description, even transcripts. Um, I always appreciate one or both of those features. Transcripts should be edited, though. <laughs> oh, that's so true. So very true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, Gail, can you discuss the importance of finding one's unique voice in writing and how aspiring female authors in particular can amplify their impact in the literary world? Great question. And thank you. And first of all, um, to everyone listening, I hope you're taking notes right now. I've already got a page of notes. And I'm really loving the common theme here from uh, the answers that are just surfacing. And that keyword is strategy. So, you know, plan your work, work your plan. So finding and owning that voice is, can be a scary task sometimes. Sometimes we have that uh, um, burning message inside of us and we want to get it out and we want to put it out there. and think we have something to say, but we have all these little cute little voices that sit on our shoulder that whisper into our ears that who's going to read your story? Who wants, what do you have to say? And creating some of that self-doubt that would go along with it. So sometimes finding that story, even though you know it's in there, can be challenging, right? Owning it is that next step that once you do find it, is owning it and going, okay, I'm going to put it out there. However it is, whether you're a speaker, whether you go, I want to put it in print, whether I want to put it on video, audio, uh, different ways, um, that's also another huge step. And for those of you who found and owned your voice, 
then you're ready to market, monetize it, or leverage and scale it. So the easiest way that I have found uh, working with women from all over the world in all different stages, just as how I described, the, the easiest way is to surround yourself, put yourself into community. I've heard it, we're also another piece that people have been saying, um, writing, I remember going back to, you know, we produced a book called Voices of the 21st Century, which makes, gives this real handhold, easy, systematized, checks all the boxes, so you don't have to worry about that. And when I first submitted a story, I had those voices and saying to me that, who's going to listen to you? What do you have to say? Right. And even going through the process of putting that story on paper was hard. <laughs> and the day it published or launched for that bestseller campaign, I had trouble getting out of bed that morning. That's how much fear was in me in putting a simple message that was in me that felt good. But putting it out there in the world became very scary because it welcomes all sorts. It opens up all sorts of doors of self-doubt, judgment, all that kind of stuff. What got me through, what I see gets other women who have been experiencing the same thing as they first start to put their words onto paper, is community, surrounding yourself. And what's coming to me is that vision of, have you ever seen that um, on social media, the lion and the lion pride is walking with her and they're all walking together and it's, and together you're that force, you're that power when people have your back and support you. So that's the big part of finding it because we are truly all gifted with a message inside, 100%, 100%. And that gift is to be shared. And so those blocks that we can experience, we can get through them if we go through them together. So just, you know, one thing to everybody listening, know that that message inside of you, um, we have the firm belief that there's no message greater, there's no message less than your gifted message. Every single message matters and it makes a difference when you share it out there. I absolutely love that. And um, just looking at some of the comments, uh, Christine says, please help me pull the book out of my head. Mm -hmm. So what what you're saying there is that is your gift inside you. And, you know, it's building up um, that belief that, that this is a book that that needs to be heard. This is a book that needs to be read. So mm -hmm. um, I absolutely love that. So, um, you know, really pulling that voice together, you know, getting over the self-doubt, um, and finding that story and then owning it, monetizing, leveraging, and then getting it to scale. So that was incredible. Um, okay. Charmaine, did you want to add in? Because you always have such great things to say. Well, I'll, I'll add in as a, an author who has been traditionally published, self-published, and published in now, almost now, 12 books, because I'm in a book, Voices of the 21st Century, that launches in a couple of weeks in February. But my experience has been with all three versions of publishing that I've been involved with as an author, um, the comments that Gail made around having a community is vital, because people get tired of us talking about our book you know, read my book, buy my book. Have you read my book? And, and I know this is where Catherine's genius really lies into. So listen, when Catherine goes and talks about digital media, but when we look at what Gail has said about the importance of community and what um, Tina has been saying about that strategy piece, really, really important to consider. And when I discovered that you don't have to do this alone, there are experts that can help you for the parts that you don't know how to do. Always recommend work in your genius zone. Let other people be contracted to do their genius zone. But the other piece is that when you build a community, writing um, isn't so lonely. You get great ideas from people. You learn from other authors. In fact, I'd say at least 50% of what I've learned about book marketing has come from watching other authors and seeing what they do and what puts a bounce in my step from seeing what others or authors are doing around their marketing. 
and how they're scaling their book, how they're growing their business around their book. So I'll pass it back to you, Victoria, for some more Q&A. Yes, um, Catherine, um, in your extensive experience with digital marketing, what are the top strategies authors should employ to boost their online presence and book sales? Mm. Thank you, Victoria. You've heard this two words actually several, five times, <laughs> strategy and community. And you want to have a strategy when you serve your community. So put away big words like digital marketing and what's online strategies. What is that? That is nothing more than serving the community that is already attracted to you, provided that you are putting yourself out there. I still have people tell me today, I just need to write my book. I need to finish my film. I need to do my thing. And then I'll, I'll worry about you know, ads and marketing and, and social media. But that's not what's going to serve you because once you finish, who are you going to promote it to? Who are you going to say, hey, you know, this has been done? Because all you can say at that point is my book's ready, come buy it. And that's not what people want to hear. In fact, today, post-COVID, there is less trust. There is less interest. There are so many options that are out there that we're oversaturated. But the one thing that you have complete control of is yourself serving your community. So what does that look like? It means that you are having a location and you know what, you can serve a hundred different places and just be completely overwhelmed, or you can pick one and get really good at it and then see what's rinse and repeatable in another location. So um, ever since I had uh, the eye injury, I had to limit my time online. I choose LinkedIn. So I create a space for my community to come every Wednesday morning and we work on an exercise, something they would be interested in. How do I know they're interested in it? Because I asked, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? What, what is it you want? They want their content seen. So I'll create exercises that help them get their content seen. Well, while they're there, you have this wonderful platform with a small dedicated group that is interested in you because you are giving so much of yourself to them. So let them know what you want, not come buy my book, but you know, do you know other people who are interested in this material? Um, can you invite somebody? And I really want you to think about this. Imagine 20 people, 20. Do you know 20 people who are interested in you and what you can share with them? And then when you say, hey, as you're learning these tips, is there somebody in your community that if they know what you know now can serve you and are interested in supporting this group? Let your community bring more people that builds your community. And they are, you know, you don't have to put it out there for complete strangers. You can build in small segments and really get a great space. You also want to take a look at, you know, what did I do in the past years that really worked? because some of that is not gonna work. You know, that term, what got you here won't get you there. So you're constantly asking, what do you want? People start dropping off. Maybe somebody else is doing a better job. Maybe you need to question, what do you wanna do? And create a strategy across, I'm not just gonna throw out some random tip. I'm gonna move people towards something that they want. And if I do these tips or these conversations with them in this order, well, they're not going to want to miss because we're all going to the same end. Now, your book happens to be at that end, but so are their projects. And now everybody's invested. Now, imagine you've shared parts of your book along the way. You've asked questions. Um, somebody mentioned earlier, share your share your book covers, <laughs> really get to, you know, let them know elements. They're just as invested as you are, and they're going to continue bringing people. So if that is something that you want, absolutely. There are so many people that are out there with books, but they're invested in you and what mm -hmm. you have to offer. They have people they can bring. It's not just up to you because that can be exhausting. Yeah. I think, you know, 
you're playing nicely into the way, the way I feel about crowdfunding in the author space, because it is about that community. It is about that connection. Um, and, you know, how often do you, when you buy a book, do you actually get to know the person behind the book? Whereas this way you do, and it, it's a two way street. I mean, I'm sure I, I'm the only one on this, you know, on this screen that's not an author yet. Um, yet, yet. yet. <laughs> and, um, but the thing is that um, I'm sure you want to hear what people feel like when they've read your book. So, you know, to get that feedback, it's, it, it's a, so definitely a, a two way street. Um, I, I, one of the things we've just had, uh, uh, we've got uh, some great feedback. So thank you, everybody. Um, there's a, a lady who's 66. She says it's frightening. She's just learned how to use a computer. And, you know, I think what one of the things that I've heard is, you know, people who don't like writing, you, know, you don't have to be able to write to be an author. You know, you can you can share your 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 brain, your your idea that that this one that we have to, you know, the, the gift that needs to be shared. But there are other ways of doing it than actually sitting in front of a computer and and, and typing it. And that sort of ties in really nicely with the question I'm going to ask to the whole panel, um, which is, um, you know, really around overcoming challenges. So in your ch uh, journey with publishing and marketing, uh, what was one significant challenge that you faced and how did you overcome it? And, um, you know, hopefully, you know, this will be really insightful for everybody listening in because I am sure the challenges that you guys have had in the past are the challenges that the people um, listening in today are currently facing. Um, does anyone want to jump in first? Tina, go for it. Yeah, this this isn't just about publishing. This is about actually how we get ourselves out into the world. And at every stage of business development, every time you decide that you're going to level up, you're going to 10x, you're going to get out there, you will hit a new and fun level of imposter syndrome. Enjoy. I'm actually currently in that spot right now myself, but I've done it so many times. While it's a pain in the ass and it's still scary, it also has a familiarity to it. But when I was first getting into business, I've had multiple businesses over the years and building platforms and, and putting myself out there as an expert in a certain area. At this time, it was a business coach in business coaching. I really had a hard time at first asking for the sale. No problem developing the relationships, but actually the exchange of money and asking for the sale was difficult for me, even though I grew up in a sales environment. My parents owned a retail business, but there was just that little bit of, oh, I don't want to be a used car salesman. And I had a mentor sit down and tell me, look, there's nothing wrong with your cookie. And I went, the hell are you talking about? That's not a cookie. He goes, no, here's the thing. If you walked around and you had a plate of fresh baked chocolate chip cookies and you offered 50 people in a room a cookie, what are people going to say? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Oh my God. Yes. No, thank you. No, mm -mm, no, not today. You know, all, you're going to get all kinds of responses, right? But what's the reason that they choose or don't choose a cookie, right? They're on a diet. Well, maybe they love cookies or they're diabetic. Or, oh my God, chocolate's the most amazing thing on the planet. It has nothing to do with the cookie and it has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with you. There's nothing wrong with your cookie. All we can do is make the invitation and people will say yes or no. And it doesn't mean a damn thing. And once I was able to kind of detach that from my ego and just say, would you like to register? Would you like to buy the book? Is this something that would interest you without attachment and unleash my inner Buddha in that way, life became a thousand times better and it made things so much less weird in conversations. And I felt so freed up to do things. And uh, one of the things I'm known for now is having sales conversations that are really wonderful and soft and gentle and easy for people to step into because they are relationship-based and I offer them a cookie. And that's it. 
<laughs> and um, that really nicely answers Liz Mason's question about, you know, starting off in the writing community and unsure of your as yet unpublished book, how can you introduce this? Your book is your cookie. And so, you know, it's a great chance to sort of to introduce it um, and to also to look at who, who wants that cookie and what, what, what are their, you know, what are their motivations behind it? And really there's, you know, Charmaine will probably attest this one. Your books are not for everyone. You know, there's sort of like, you, you, you know, there is somebody, there is a group of people, there's somebody out there who will absolutely love your book and it'll be the, the best book ever. And it'd be the book that's the right book for them, but it's not for everybody. So it's finding out who 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 is ready to devour your cookie. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in there with a uh, just to add on to that? I love that. Never I like the cookie analogy. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Um, but in in speaking with women and who are exploring their stories, uh, and that go, I want to write a book, and I get it. Why you want to write a book? And when I've spoke with people, I, they go, Yeah, I'm, I'm just I want to publish my book now. I'll go, Okay, well, is your manuscript ready? And they'll go, No. Where are you at? I'm at that eighty percent. And they're that's a common thing I always hear 80% I thought what is what happens at 80% all of a sudden we run up against ourselves at 80% all those other pieces start coming in and what happens is it stalls out the book and so with when we created the voices of 20 voices of the 21st century experience what I found is it's overcome in a very easy way for authors that so they don't bump up against themselves so they can break through fear because it's that system and it's the system that creates success and when you go into something so when we talk about I can't write perfect right there's editors who make you look good with whatever you have to say distribution leverage of community all those kind of things that we would bump up against in that 80% mark, what if that's all taken care of for you? So when we can teach an individual that has that, the most important part is get that story out onto paper. But if we can help leverage or teach what is the next step in a very easy way, then that's where I find the confidence build up. And I can't tell you the amount of authors, I mean, Charmaine, uh, you're a big part of that is, when they get there, when the story gets down on paper, uh, and then that book gets published, everybody has crossed that finish line together. What happens is I see an author go out and write their solo book in about 90 days done because they have the, the knowledge of what's happening gives that confidence. And you've already now um, broken through, I guess, that imposter syndrome where you know your message matters and now it's ingrained in you and it's part of you and part of your business and then uh, there's no stopping you. That's and you've it. got that and you've got that community that mm -hmm. you were a part of and yes. uh, which all of our panelists have talked about today. Absolutely. Community strategy. <laughs> and cookies got to throw those and cookies, cookies. got to have the cookies I'd like to jump in with overwhelm if I may so one thing about my industry is that there is always going to be something new there's always the risk of something that did work doesn't work and if there's this many platforms you need to be on this many platforms there's text there's video there's images and now there's the the chaos of AI and I would like to teach you something it took me 30 years to learn and going blind. Because two years ago, I lost my sight and it came out of the clear blue sky. So I used to work 12 hour days because I could. I loved online. I don't mind reading all this information. If I wasn't on my phone, I was on the computer, not on the computer, I was on the laptop. That is a, That was a choice. But once this happened, and I was three weeks away from starting a launch, and maybe it was a bit of a message from the universe, I can see people looking, but uh, what, does, what I discovered is I had to sit for much of a year, mostly in the dark, save the eyesight, it did come back, 
But when I first came on, I had 30 minutes. I've worked up to four and a half hours a day online. But I want you to think of if you are left with only 30 minutes to do your work, all the thousands of things you have to do disappear to that one priority. So take a moment later today and say, if you only had one thing you got to do today and one thing you had to do tomorrow and one thing the day after that, what would that be? And it's going to make a lot of things disappear. So what I do now with everything I do, including courses, is I break things down because people are busy. Here's what I must do today. And of those must do's, the one priority. Here's the should do. I should do this today, but it's not a must and it's not the priority. And then there's the nice to do's. And you know what? Those nice to do's are your shortest activity and it's what everybody runs to do first, but it's not what's going to move you forward. So make sure if your list, and that's what mine used to look like, 101 things to do today, take a moment. If you had one thing you could only do, what's the one thing you can identify on that list? And take the rest, at least the, the three quarters down and say, I'm going to put this to some other time and then schedule it so that you can deal with it later. And then don't think about it because you've put it somewhere. You have a time, you'll go through it and get back to your must do's and your one priority you will breathe a sigh of relief. And it is the huge silver lining that happened for me this year, last year, sorry. <laughs> I love that. I, I just want to comment uh, that such richness here, Tina, Catherine, Gail, Victoria, what popped up for me, Catherine, when you were talking about that one thing, because my tendency, and I got called on this by a coach about 10 years ago, he called me on it. He said, did you ever notice Charmaine that your one thing has like 45 bullets under bullet points under it? That's not one point that's 46. So, so I, I really started to think about it, even though I thought I would simplify something I was doing exactly what you said we often do Catherine we just add on this overwhelm. And I loved that I, I would just have a sticky and, and sort of write down the biggest priority that had to happen today. But the other thing that I think is really important that has been mentioned is that making sure that you time block and that's a term that one of my coaches shared with me time block getting it in the calendar moving it out of your head from the to-do list to actually in your calendar being as important as the phone call you have to make in two hours or the Zoom meeting you have to attend tomorrow. And that's been a real growth for me as, as well. You mentioned it has been for, for you, Catherine. And that's probably one of the big turning points for me. And what I found is that as I completed one task, some of the other things didn't matter anymore. And so things started to actually fall off my to-do list. And because they were written down somewhere, I wasn't um, worried that I would lose the thought or lose the idea. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate what you're talking about today, because these are all important and essential steps in not only publishing your book, but also in promoting your book and profiting from it. Mm -hmm. And even writing, sort of making sure you set aside time and as you say, treat it as important as a, a Zoom call or anything else, because otherwise it'll be never, never, because we're always not good at prioritizing stuff for ourselves, which is often, you know, where the book comes from initially. Um, you, you sort of touched on a little thing, and I'm going to sort of jiggle that one and ask another question. So looking ahead, what do you see as a key trend or development in the world of publishing and authorship that aspiring authors should be aware of or prepare for in 2024? Who would like to take that one first? Trends in publishing. It's a big one again, because it's uh, your message. It, it starts with, I can't remember who said it first, but when you visualize, you when you're starting to work with your client, you're saying, where do you want, oh, I think it was you, Victoria. Where do you, how do you see this book working for you? And I think that's the most important key is, you know, when I'm speaking with someone, I say, let's stop for a second. Okay, yeah, you want to get your story out there, but how do you, how do you visualize work, 
where that book is. Are you standing on a stage? Is it in bookstores? Is it in libraries? Like, I mean, this book can go in anywhere as an audio. And so it's your audience that is kind of your, your specific audience. I mean, there's, there's trends in all different kinds of industry, but I, one thing that when I'm just from my experience in talking with women around the world is to really get to your truth, get to your passion. Uh, the more that we can get that out there and, and to be able to have that passion and purpose come through in, in who we are, I think is a big trend. Someone was mentioning trust earlier on that um, we've stepped into a world of distrust. And so if we can make the change in breaking through that and showing up with in our truth and truly with the desire to the cookie analogy of, hey, this is for you take it or leave it but it comes wholeheartedly with heart truth made with passion love whatever it is that gift to give to you um personally i've in 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 our with the women i work with um who are you know just your everyday women who have her business and who want to um to to get her voice and message out there that's what i would say is the trend in in our in our world that we're mm -hmm. doing yeah yes yeah, that's really interesting and I, and I think you know it, we're in an interesting time in the world and uh i think that's certainly driving what people want to read it's Tina. definitely um driving what people want to read want to listen to and with the combination of uh, ai coming in heavily to our world it provides a tremendous amount of opportunity and a tremendous amount of discernment required. So uh, one of the things happening in the audiobook industry right now is that AI voices are kind of have been coming into audiobooks. And so when you're thinking about doing an audiobook, it's something that you definitely want to look into. But if you don't know anything about audiobooks, it can be very, very seductive to look at AI voices for audiobooks. And I'm going to be very clear. At some point, AI is going to get good enough for audiobooks. And I'm actually looking forward to that day because it's another tool that expands human creativity as a possibility. However, it is my very strong belief that AI is not good enough for audiobooks right now. It's good enough to create a one minute sample. But if you listen to any of these AI voices on any of the platforms for any amount of time, your brain will start to rebel because AI cannot breathe. And it freaks out the inside of your brain to hear a voice for a couple of hours that doesn't breathe. It's biological. It's neurological. It's a thing. I'm a therapist by training. I have a background in psychology. It's a very strange thing to listen to a voice that doesn't breathe. And after a while, you start to kind of squick out. And so when you hear the samples of these voices and you're tempted to do an audiobook with AI, keep that in mind. Another very simple fact is AI voice audiobooks aren't selling. They're not selling. And even if you can go and get them done right now with um, Google and whatnot, like for free, they're, go look at it. It's fascinating what they're doing. It really is interesting and you should know about it. Um, what they're not selling on the back end. And it's way more work than you think it is because it's not, oh, get a voice, get it done. You have to go back through that audiobook and find all the places it screwed up because it didn't know how to pronounce somebody's name and it didn't know how to say that word. I have somebody who produces strictly Judaic content and AI cannot produce the very kind of word in a lot of uh, Yiddish and, and Hebrew words. So there's a lot of little things you don't know you don't know. And so this is a big trend in audio right now that we just need to be aware of and you need to be discerning because I've unfortunately had a bunch of authors come and get work with us with human voices because they tried to go the AI route and they put a ton of time and money behind it and it didn't work. So it will get there. It's just not there yet. That's a really interesting insight, Tina. And, and you know, I know, you know, it, it's been a year since ChatGPT has come out and people are saying, use it to write books. And it, it might be a thought starter, but one of the biggest things is 
it doesn't have any examples. So it doesn't have any truth. It doesn't have any real, um, you know, real stories behind it. So the first time you see it, you go, wow. But it's a bit like you're saying, Tina, about not breathing. You know, you soon get to realize, okay, this, this doesn't, there's something not right about this and it's a turn off. And so, you know, that's something that I think we can, we'll definitely see. Um, but it certainly gets brains thinking and it also stops, I would say, writer's block or something. You know, it's, it, you know, use it as a tool, but it isn't the only tool. I just want to add something to that. So uh, I do prompt strategy. Mine start out with 30 lines and then continue. So I want you to think about, hey, how should I write this book or how should I create my content? And if you're not putting any, and I'm talking about 20 minimum lines of why yours is going to be different, imagine 20,000 people asking the same question, getting a lot of the same responses, and that's the content you're going to put out there. People have seen it. They want to see your interpretation of that content. So make sure, yes, absolutely, exactly what Victoria said, ideas, now put your spin on them and get them out there. Do not take it, copy and paste it because you will lose trust so quickly because people have seen that already in droves. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, I'm going to open to the floor. I see we so have some fabulous questions. Um, I know person asking about the names and books, the authors we did the crowdfunding for. We will put those in the email afterwards and um, uh, also about the, the programs. I see a question there. Um, a really interesting question here from Bennett. What if you're not an expert in your area? Do you need to prove that it works? I've come up with a methodology. Do I need to team with an expert to prove scientifically, social sciences, that it works? Go, Catherine. I'll just say something quick. If it doesn't work for you, have you made it work for others? Use your clients or use people in your example, because what worked for them People are looking for the results, not, nece not necessarily. It depends what it is and who the audience is, but that what you do for others could be the equal of what you can do for yourself. Yeah, that's a really important point because, and it probably depends on what kind of, what the methodology methodology is. Is it something scientific? Is it is it a recipe? Is it a formula that you use, like Catherine said, that works for others? We have a seven step raise a dream sponsorship model that we use and teach our clients and have tested it and tested it and tested it, and so that is the model we teach and our clients have success from that. So. Um, it, it, it'll probably depend a little bit on what, what it is that your model is about, but I love what you said, Catherine, is has your model worked for other people as well as yourself? And uh, that's really important. Right. Um, uh, I haven't written the book yet, so should I uh, build the community before I start writing? <laughs> it goes hand in hand, really, doesn't it? Um... It, it's because there, there is a day when that book is birthed and the difference of having an audience for it or not is how that book comes out and hits the ground running or comes out and now I've got to go build the community. So I say get into a community ASAP, start building. So whatever strategies you're using, come into an existing community, uh, start connecting on LinkedIn, building up uh, relationships, start building your database your database becomes your number one asset in your business mm -hmm. and that is your piece that you'll be able to start to see that hey i have a book coming soon coming who said they were in real retail right you know coming soon strategies right when there's a new product or launch those things work so uh and it builds up the hype and the awareness of what's coming what's coming and then bam it hits and then that's how you can get the that attraction to it right away. Perfect. That's a great answer, Gail. Is it advantageous to send a complimentary book to potential bulk buyers? In my case, the groups are enormous. Immigration lawyers, agents, ministries, universities, libraries, career programs, university agents who market their universities to potential international students. That is a very large group. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'll answer that one quickly. And then by all means, um, whoever wrote the question, feel free to email me. And uh, when we send out the contact information, the quick answer is yes, potentially, but with a strategy. And, and so what I mean is sending your book around to organizations, potential sponsors, um, groups like immigration lawyers and so forth. Um, if they don't understand the context of why you're sending it to them, typically they go, wow, that's cool. And then it goes on the bookshelf and it never gets looked at and it never gets read. So it's got to have a strategy. And I am a firm believer if you want people to do something with your book, like share it with their group, you know, their audience, their student, students, it's really important to build the relationship with the person that you're sending the book to. That is where the magic happens. It's the same thing for book sales. Magic happens when we build relationships and springboard our strategies from there. So relationship first. And, uh, and then second, I would say that to really just get focused instead of all these groups apply, what would be one? Let's use Catherine's strategy. One, one group, and then just work it from there. Then applying the strategy, the second group. And that's how I would approach that. But happy to answer more questions. People can email us once Victoria's team sends out the follow-up. Good question. Yeah. Uh, could I build on that a little bit? Yeah, go for it. Um, so just from what Charmaine was saying, let's say that you were to take some Catherine's methodology and I define the group of people that you wanted to work with. And then as somebody who is the author of this book and kind of a burgeoning expert in this area, you were to create a way to connect with those people that goes beyond, hey, can we have coffee? So this is one of the ways the podcasting really shines. So you can actually connect with experts that you want to have a relationship with. You invite them onto something of value, like a panel live discussion on LinkedIn Live, like a podcast, uh, like a webinar. And you start to build that audience and you start to build those relationships. You follow up with people afterwards. You express appreciation. There's a whole methodology about that. And then Charmaine is so deeply expert in building these relationships that then progress into other areas. And now you've got fans. Now you have resources. And then as you start to build that, then, you know, I, I can't even imagine how the crowdfunding then kind of comes into play around that as well. And then the speaker piece as you start to develop larger and larger audiences. So you start to see how these pieces kind of all fit together into starting to develop a platform that isn't just about the book, but has multifacets. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just want to say, you know, as we wrap up, I'd like to extend a heartfelt thank you to all our panelists for their invaluable insights. Um, community, strategy, cookies. We've covered it all today. Um, I know we haven't been able to answer everybody's questions, but we will be sending out an email. Tina, that was good timing to mention that uh, follow up. So you can you can definitely follow back up with everybody on this call um, if you have anything specific. Um, and uh, but we hope that this discussion has inspired and equipped you with some knowledge to make 2024 the year that your book comes to life. Remember every step you take towards publishing and you all have that gift inside you. But every step you take towards publishing and promoting your book is a step towards realizing your dream and keep that passion alive. Don't hesitate to reach out to resources, to us and to the communities that can support your journey. And I just want to say thank you again to our panelists. Wow. I have pages of notes. I feel like I need to summarize them and put them in the follow-up email, Victoria, because there was so much goodness that came out of this ideas that I'm going to put into action. Thank you for that. Thank you, Victoria, for being such an exquisite host. Um, we've done lots of webinars today and I'm loving the panel interviews. I yes. just so appreciate having so many different um, thought processes and perspectives. So really appreciate what was shared. And I just want to remind people when you get the follow up email, you'll be able to listen to that recording, uh, listen back to the tips from the panelists, even Catherine scripting for us what should we should be saying when we're trying to build a community. And I just want to say, just take one step. It doesn't all have to happen today. Um, just take one step because that book, it's time for that book. 
Uh, the world needs your message. Build the community at the same time and may 2024 be the year for all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Charmaine. Thank you, panelists. And thank you to everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.